Now, today's uh, speaker, I'm delighted to say, is Dominic Jaynes, who is Professor of Modern History at Keele uh, University, having moved there from Birkbeck College in London. He is a cultural historian who specializes in the study of texts and visual images relating to Britain in its local and international contexts since the 18th century. But he also teaches and researches on the wider histories of gender, sexuality, and religion. And he has written several books in these fields, including Visions of Queer Martyrdom from John Henry Newman to Derek Jarman in 2015, Oscar Wilde Prefigured in 2016, and the wonderfully uh, entitled From Freak to Chic, uh, Gay Men uh, in and Out of Fashion after Oscar Wilde in 2021. Most recently, he has produced a British Dandies for our own uh, Bodleian Library Publishing, and it's on that subject that he will talk to us uh, this evening. So I'll now hand over to Dominic James. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm well here, the virtual here, <laughs> to be with you. Um, and obviously we've all been involved in uh, a lot of online Zoom kind of situations. And obviously, I mean, I, I always relish the opportunity to, to speak in front of a, a, a live audience. I'm using my lively imagination to think of you sitting kind of in front of me. Uh, and also very much looking forward to having a kind of a politely distanced <laughs> discussion via the Q&A at the end of this. So I've been asked to uh, to talk to you for about something like 35 minutes or so, followed by Q&A. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, the, the background purpose of this is, you know, I'm an, I'm an author and I've written a book. Um, and uh, I'm always very excited to be able to sort of wave these things. They are, um, I'm sure many of you, uh, you know, you all read books, some of you write books, uh, you'll be aware that it's a slow burn process. And um, that recent book of mine, the, the Freak to Chic one, uh, which was about marginalization and fashion. Uh, I, I was recently clearing out an old PC, a really old fashioned kind of desktop, big funky thing. Um, and basically blanking the hard disk and so it could be sent off to be recycled and all that sort of stuff. And I found, as I was going through it, um, the very first Word file where I noted down some ideas towards that book. And it was dated uh, August, I think, 2014. The book itself arrived in summer uh, 2021 to the... Uh, uh, the wider public. So I have, in other words, been thinking about dandies and dandyism for quite some time. Um, it's elements of what you may read in that book, uh, derived from research that has made its way into a variety of different places. But this is a completely new synthesis for me. Um, in some of my other books, I was really interested in focusing on um, things like gender and sexuality, which play an important role in uh, British dandies, hinted at by the subtitle Engendering Scandal and Fashioning a Nation. The publishers were rather keen on that, by the way. Um, originally, I thought of just calling it British Dandies Fashioning a Nation, um, but that really seemed to imply that I was just interested in fashion and clothes. And of course, my attitude to dandyism is that dandyism and dress and fashion in general are about far more than just clothes. In the early 19th century, the writer Thomas Carlyle produced a, a quite extraordinary sort of novel or treatise, it's the Sartori Sartus, in which he denounced the figure of the dandy as being a mere clothes wearing man. And that's really quite interesting. It kind of opposes being a man, a real man, 
Mine doesn't just mean you like an immoderate heterosexual man. It means actually someone of rationality and substance with someone who is all about wearing clothes. Now, there's something rather odd about this because, after all, <laughs> shall we put it mildly, we live in Northern Europe and actually it's not very sensible to go around without clothes if you actually want to live for very long. So actually, we do have to wear clothes. So what was Carlyle's beef? What's his problem? Well, his problem is about the idea of someone who spends too much time focusing on their clothes. They become almost like a sort of human, almost like a human carapace, if you see what I mean. That there's a shell around the outside and nothing much inside, a bit like a nut. You know, in the in the old days, we used to have um, at Christmas bags of actual nuts that had actual shells on them. And it was regarded as being very decadent. You might actually have shelled nuts. Well, and now you just buy shelled nuts. But anyway, every so often, I remember the disappointment as a little kid, cracking a particularly hard uh, hazelnut or something or other, and actually finding that there wasn't actually any nut inside. So it's that sense of sort of disappointment that you get out of people writing about critiques of dandies. But of course, there's another thing which is a bit kind of peculiar about this, which is, you know, if you're really dismissing the dandy as a sort of empty man, a kind of shadow man, a sort of uh, a nut with no seed <laughs> inside, uh, why are you spending all this time on it? What's the problem? Why is it such an, a, a significant target? Well, I think part of the answer, I mean, you know, this is where my interest in dandies actually comes from, is to say that actually dandyism was, and still sometimes is, about lots of different things. This apparent, I suppose in academic terms, you could call it an empty signifier, you know, the sense of there's something there, but it doesn't mean anything. In fact, there's all sorts of, uh, to paraphrase, there's a book called Gender Trouble uh, by Judith Butler. To paraphrase that, all sorts of cultural trouble is freighted by the man who pays a lot of attention to his dress and can be labelled a dandy. And this is particularly a problem in Britain. It's a problem, it's an excitement, it's a controversy. And that is what the book is actually all about. So it is about clothes, it is about fashion and fashioning, but it's also about why that was taken so seriously by some of the men who did it, and was also taken so seriously by some of the men who didn't, like Thomas Carlyle. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, go into the wild excitement of sharing my screen and showing you some visuals. Okay. Okay, excellent. So British dandies too much and too little. We'll find out soon why too much and too little. Too much. So the visuals that I'm going to be showing you, um, they have various little kind of references put up in the corner and so forth. Um, and if anyone wants to follow those up, I can explain to you what Danboy Wana <laughs> means, for example. I don't think it's necessary for me to give you the full reference, but I can go back and let you know. The reason why I'm starting here is because the emergence of the figure of the dandy is prefigured by a variety of other terms that are used for dressy men. And these sorts of terms, some of them are fops, fribbles, macaronis. They run roughly from the restoration of the monarchy after the Commonwealth, right way through the 18th century. 
through to the period when you get the appearance of the term dandy, the widespread appearance of the word dandy, and that occurs around the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Now, one of the reasons why uh, I think people get very excited about male behavior is because of changing patterns of attitudes towards men and women. So basically, in the 16th century through to the 17th century, aristocratic men and women often dressed, well, they didn't dress identically, but they often had clothes made of really very similar colorful fabrics. If you fast forward through to say the mid 19th century, you will see a dramatic change has taken place. Men and women's dress has become radically different and it, it's been different in shape and it's also very different in color. Man's dress has become very, very plain and women's dress has become, if anything, even more colorful uh, with the use of new artificial dyes than it had been in the 18th uh, century when uh, imported Chinese silks were all the rage. Now, that process of images for men and women becoming more and more similar, uh, sorry, becoming more different, was accompanied by a reconfiguration of how men and women were meant to sort of behave and relate to each other. And this has often been termed the kind of a rise of an increasing sense of politeness between the sexes. And here are some texts that sort of illustrate what this is actually about. And this is the notion that a woman is actually meant to be moral, virtuous, uh, polite, elegant, reserved, etc., etc. And ideally, a man was meant to be able to respond to that in an appropriate manner. So this is the idea of being polite. Um, was meant to actually control the excesses of male behavior. So what we're actually talking about here is uh, some of the things that we think about nowadays, you know, male abuse of power, male sex pests, male bullying of women, all this kind of stuff. So we have a sense of separateness for men and women but also a sense of mutual respect between them. And this ultimately leads through to Victorian theories, for example, John Ruskin's theories of uh, the separate spheres, separate but complementary spheres, men and women. Now, this meant that, okay, a polite world, in which you have separateness between men and women, distinction between men and women, and polite connections between them meant that overlaps between male behavior and female behavior were scrutinized to see whether they fitted these evolving patterns of decency. And a man dressing up as a woman, for example, was often seen as a ludicrous figure, an amusing figure, a figure of fun. And here we have your hands often is David Garrick in Vanbrugh's Provoked Wife, which is a play in which originally uh, the characters don't actually cross-dress, but he actually did so. And this has been painted up to show him looking deliberately ridiculous uh, in a, uh, an enormous woman's frock at the time, but the stance of a man. Now, we then have a lot of concern about manly women and womanly men. And in a sense, it's triggered off by this process of rapprochement or politeness between the sexes. In the old days, where it was kind of considered okay if a little bit extreme rakish behavior for a man to chase women around, this is the kind of libertine ideology. It was fairly clear who was the man and who was the woman. But in an age of increasing politeness, it became less clear. 
and quite tricky actually. How could you be a real man and yet suitably polite and genteel at the same time? At the same time as all of this is going on, the fashion industry is slowly becoming more and more uh, associated with women rather than with men. Now, this is connected with the business about men's clothing becoming plainer over time. Now, the reason for this, men's clothing becoming plainer and women's clothing remaining colourful uh, and impressive, well, it's one way of differentiating men and women when politeness rules are actually suggesting that they need to behave in more similar ways. That's one sort of explanation. Other explanations that were brought up in the 20th century were to suggest that there was a, a kind of uh, sartorial revolution, which is often da dated to the late um, 18th century and particularly to the influence of the French Revolution. Now, the result of this, this cultural fashion revolution, was something um, that uh, an early 20th century writer, Flegel, um, described as being the great masculine renunciation of color. So men, in order to retain their masculinity, despite being polite and chivalrous and all this sort of stuff, uh, rather than racy hyper males running around after women the whole time, what they do is they go into uniform, basically. They go into a kind of drab. So they renounce the flashy dress that some of their rakish male predecessors would have actually had. And what happens is that the look for men becomes increasingly modeled on military dress which of course is obviously gendered rather masculine for obvious reasons, and becomes much plainer, much tighter fitting as you go into the 20th century, uh, into the 19th century. Uh, and what we're talking about is the evolution into what we would recognize as the modern business suit. And I remember, you know, the last time I went to try and buy a business suit, I went into a large store and I could buy gray suits. I could wear, I could buy brown suits. I could buy blue suits. I could buy black suits, and that was about it. It's an extraordinarily restricted palette, in other words. Uh, and that is a particular cultural construction that you can actually look, date back in the changes in men's clothing to uh, the, the late 18th century, early 19th century. So what do you do about men who don't play by these new rules, who insist on being interested in exuberant clothes, colourful clothes, clothes, well, one thing you can do is to associate those men with effeminacy. So once you actually suggest that there's something peculiarly feminine about colourful fabrics, you can then suggest there's a something feminine about an interest in such fabrics, and you can associate um, people such as man milliners the man who works in the fashion industry making hats or making dresses or whatever else it might be, as being a sort of strange kind of man, woman. And we've got another example here. Um, and what we're looking at is a kind of, um, a sort of kind of camp feminine uh, personage who is kind of effectively a sort of, almost a member of a kind of third gender. Now, interestingly enough, this is the sort of image that is associated with overly dressy men in the 18th century, and the late, late, late 17th as well, but also the 18th century. Now, you know, you don't have time to read all of this, but hopefully you can see in the first line that we're talking about fops. Fops and foppery, what are they? One who is foolishly attentive to or vain in his appearance, dress or manners, a dandy or an exquisite. For example, Sir Fopling Flutter in Etheridge's Man of Mode. 
has affectations of dress and manner recently returned from France, a Frenchified vocabulary uh, on hand with which to discuss them. He appears adorned with pretty new tassels, a new cut coat to make him look slender and long-waisted, etc., etc. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize to you is the point about France. Because, you know, the, the people in the book are not just dandies, they're British dandies. And there's something very controversial about dandyism in Britain. And this kind of dressiness is often associated by the British with continentals, sometimes with Italians, uh, but not particularly with the French. Now, there is some basis to this because Paris was the center of um, Europe's fashion industry during this time. But it does have another, a, a, a number of other such implications. So for example, what you get is an opposition between the decent down to earth Englishman, I don't know, a slid between British and English there, uh, or Britain, it works perfectly well in the 18th century, right? who doesn't pay too much attention to his dress and is quite happy to use local woolen fabrics, for example. Oh, and has a taste for English ale and all this sort of business as well. And then you have the alleged exquisite, a member probably of an aristocratic family who'd been on the grand tour, gone to Italy and picked up uh, local tastes of which I'll talk some more in a bit, uh, and also gone to Paris and dressed himself up rather spectacularly and then flaunted it on the streets of London. Now, there is some evidence that this really did happen, that, uh, for example, suits of French court dress were purchased in Paris, and these are really rather wonderful things, complete with gold, silver thread, and all this sort of business. In France, they were court uniforms. You were only supposed to wear them at official occasions, um, whereas what happened is a lot of the young men just sort of wore them around the town when they came back to London, causing something of a stir. And as far as they were concerned, they weren't necessarily um, tasseled exquisites uh, who couldn't appear without being overdressed. As far as they were concerned, they looked really rather terrific figures of men dressed in full French kind of splendor. But they could then be mocked for doing that. Now, their mockery. So caricature. Now, this is really very important. Unfortunately, we're before the age of photographs. So we don't have photographs of dandies uh, or fobs. Um, there are occasional suits of clothes that are preserved, but there aren't very many of them. So actually, a lot of our evidence for this is discussions of fobs and dandies on stage or uh, in newspaper articles or paintings and caricatures, particularly satirical prints. And I just put up Thomas Patch's caricature uh, group in Florence simply because um, these were, these were uh, a bunch of uh, highly cultured men, some of whom were not the most uh, butch on existence, uh, who established a kind of uh, uh, a sort of colony, a cultural colony, uh, having enjoyed the, the Grand Tour so much they never really actually went, went, wanted to go home. Now, back in London, the disputes over, I suppose we can call it proto-dandyism, because they're not using the term dandy yet, really hot up around the 1760s and 1770s. Remember David Garrick? So we've seen a picture of him uh, in bad drag in that unconvincing frock earlier on. He gets accused of sodomy. I mean, I didn't officially, it's not brought up in the court of law or anything like that, but insinuations go round that he is a sexual uh, deviant or he has committed acts of sexual deviance, right? You don't necessarily have to label him as having an identity category. And he refutes this in a not very good poem with the Fribliriad. 
where he attacks those who attack him as frivols. And what's really interesting here is that he talks about them as, well, I mean, you can see feminine, masculine, neuter. He specifically associates um, overly dressed, overperformed men with gender and kind of sexual deviance, basically. He had basically accuses them of sort of standing around, waving their backsides um, to get attention. He uses the word bum, by the way, good old fashioned English. And here's a picture of their leader, Fitzgerald, who he has here as Fizgig. So, fribbles. You then get lots of people talking about the phenomenon of the modern fribble. And here's another gentleman uh, working in the fashion industry, uh, another man milliner. It's not a very subtle joke here. Um, the woman has come into the shop. She wants to buy some fabric. Uh, he measures it using a yard stick, uh, which is actually slightly too short. It's not a full yard in length. So in other words, he's got a short charge, he's got a short change up by selling her short yards of cloth. And she said, hang on, I'm not to be done in this manner. Your yard is short by an inch. Well, um, yard was also slang for penis at this time. And his measuring stick, which is pointing perkily kind of out from his crotch, it's a fairly innuendo. This is not a real man because well, you can use your imagination. So we've got some powerful kind of innuendo going on here about what happens if you get too close to the world of a fashion. And if you're a man, it actually starts sort of corroding away at you and turning you into something a little bit too much like a, a in the misogynist uh, views of the time, a feeble woman. Um, oh yes, Horace Walpole. Sorry, this is cut out of something. I don't know quite why it's, it's appeared in a data box. I must have forgot to clip the outside of this here. Um, I just want to emphasize here that there are some associations between, I suppose, same-sex desire. It's difficult to, to talk about what the term might actually be precisely here. Um, and, non-butch behavior and i've argued that in one of our previous books about um horace walpole and, and the book i wrote is called picturing the closet which is about secret kind of sexual desires but i think the point that i would want to make here is that you know men who are in some kind of proto closet because this is way before modern sexual identity categories are, are, are stabilized nothing like that but anyway people who want to be rather quiet about their kind of sexual interests Actually, they're not typically the people who are going to really court controversy by deliberately overdressing and swanning around and, uh, and outraging the masses. So uh, I, I have a feeling a lot of those people would actually rather underdress and be a little bit kind of discreet. So what we're looking at here is the evolution of stereotypes. Now, here is a major stereotype. And it's a stereotype of a figure called a macaroni. So the macaronis were another kind of dandy. And I'm sipping tea because I found it's a good way to keep my voice going. Because by five o'clock in the afternoon, I've actually been teaching for a few hours earlier on. Uh, and it's a danger of giving out. So forgive me. Okay, so who's, what are macaronis? Well, you know what macaroni is because you know what macaroni cheese is. Um, you may have also heard the lyric um, yeah, of Yankee Doodle, which has a reference to macaroni. Stuck, the, stuck, the guy stuck a, fe a feather in his hat and called macaroni. That lyric, which is a kind of anti-British song in the context of the American Revolution. It was originally a British uh, song, which was laughing at a 
backwards country bumpkin who thought he was dressing up all in the tip top of fashion by sticking a feather in his battered cap and thinking that he was a macaroni. So you kind of laugh at him for being sort of ignorant. What were macaronis? Well, they were people who were too knowing, actually. These were people who had gone off on the grand tour to Italy. And while there, as I mentioned before, had picked up local tastes. Now, the variety of local tastes that they could come back with, which would cause trouble, one of them is Roman Catholicism. Um, another one, uh, potentially, I suppose, it's not exactly a taste, but it's a phenomenon. They might have picked up BD when they were traveling around because apparently prostitutes are much cheaper in Italy than they were in, in London. Another thing that people said was they might have picked up se other sexual vices. And this is the association of uh, Roman Catholic priesthood with um, chasing around after boys, basically, because they're not decently married from the Protestant point of view. Macaroni, of course, is also a pasta. And as far as British patriots were concerned, uh, what you were supposed to eat was, well, beef. This is manly food, right? It provides strength, it provides vitality, it provides proof that Britain has high, the highest living standards in the world because ordinary people supposedly could in fact afford to eat very well. Now, the other thing about beef, um, is that if it's not very good cut or it's not cooked for a very long time, it's actually quite tough. So uh, in other words, to successfully eat beef, you actually have to have reasonably strong teeth. And as we also know, uh, with the sugar craze of the 18th century, a lot of people's teeth were pretty rubbish. So there was a very strong association between being able to eat beef and being strong. So we have such lyrics as the roast beef of old England. Etc. Et so in that context, uh, what sort of men uh, were they who came back dressed in the height of French fashions, demanding plates of pasta? And um, pasta, as far as the a lot of the British were concerned, was something uh, sort of well. Like, I mean, the British they overcooked it, right? So rather like the traditional British actually to vegetables, that the the, 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 the the hell is boiled out of them. Um, and they're mushy. And the idea is that pasta was something the British thought would, you know, you fed to babies, this kind of pap, or, or old women with no teeth. So young men who want to eat macro, want to eat this stuff, are really perverse, quite weird. Um, and there's a whole series of um, scandals, including sexual scandals around this time, including one in, in which a society man who was widely badged the macaroni was put on trial for sodomy. And what happens is that there is a kind of panic uh, that the aristocracy is getting decadent and the print shops fill up with pictures like this one. So this is a macaroni fashion. So you have, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's painted, right? It would have been black and white printed, uh, hand painted. But I mean, the general idea is that you have a brightly colored coat, you have an absolutely enormous wig. Uh, and in France, a very high wig was in fact women's fashion rather than men's fashion. Um, you stand in a particularly ele elegant women's kind of way. You have a very small pointy sword, which like the yardstick is meant to be a gender indicator. Um, and in this particular case, how do you like me? You, you stand in the pose that a young lady might do. Uh, if she's being coquettish to a man. So we've got gender inversion, we've got the implications of sexual impropriety and all sorts of other things centering on this particular type of dandy. And I think I've got about another five or 10 minutes just to give you an idea of where we're at time-wise. So there are various, lots of different pictures of these dandies. So here we have Philip Dawes, the macaroni, a real character of the late masquerade. Um, the point to be made here is that people at masquerades, some of them appeared as macaronis with particularly enormous wigs. And it wasn't entirely clear whether they were a macaroni or they were sort of impersonating a macaroni, right? So you have a further level of kind of complexity around dandyism that people actually get to sort of rather self-knowingly perform it. 
and there are all sorts of other ones about country gentlemen being outraged about the young sons coming back from the grand tour looking quite outrageous. Now, there are a couple, there is a sort of transitional phase. The macaroni craze, it does seem to be real. There was a fashion for very bright dress and very tall wigs. It goes out in the 1780s rather rapidly. And it is replaced by a much more refined sort of look. And he is a pioneer of that. And he, he's called Brook Boothby. And he's reading Rousseau. Well, he's posing with Rousseau anyway, uh, supposedly in a country glade in 1781. He's a man of sensibility, so he combines politeness with a very precise um, attention to detail in his clothes, his understated clothes. And this is where the Regency dandy emerges. And this is where we go from too much to too little. When Thackeray, uh, made fun of George the Fourth, and this is in the mid 19th century. He laughed at him, just like Carlyle laughing at the dandy, saying, "This George, what was he? I try and take him to pieces, and I find silk stockings, padding, stays, a coat with frogs, and a fur collar, a star and blue ribbon, a pocket handkerchief prodigiously scented, one of Truefit's best nutty brown wigs reeking with oil." a set of teeth and a huge black stock, under waistcoats, more under waistcoats, and then nothing. It's like the nut with nothing inside. So the fear of being attacked for overdressing and for being a sort of Frenchified effeminate, here's Cruikshank laughing at emotional Frenchmen, um, hugging and sort of kissing, and rubbing themselves up against pillars and various other things, leads to a craze in Britain for a more masculine style of dandy dress. Um, this in its turn gets parodied as a form of monstrosity, as in 1799. And this is where you basically construct masculinity by adding fake pads onto your, in this case, shoulders to make it look like you've got enormous shoulder muscles. And there's some evidence that people actually did this. I have a wealth of illustrations, but by, bearing in mind the time, I think I might have to speed up through one or two of these. Um, but just to say that dressing up in um, tight fitting, apparently very masculine uniforms uh, in the context of the Napoleonic Wars isn't necessarily a guarantee that you're not going to be attacked for being a dressy man and therefore potentially some kind of gender deviant and potentially also a sexual deviant. So here, for example, we have George Cruikshank's ancient military dandies of 1450, where he's basically having a laugh at um, various continental soldiers in their peculiar uniforms who were uh, over here uh, as a result of their alliance with Britain in the Napoleonic Wars. And you'll be familiar with Beau Brummel, uh, I'm sure. The crucial thing to know about Bro Brummel is about effect effectively what he does is he tries to avoid all of these sort of attacks and insinuations by talking about a kind of austere perfectionism in dress. It's a kind of minimalism. The only thing that he wasn't minimalist about were, was his necktie, which as you can see in these was rather large and rather spectacular and very carefully tied. This is then how the, 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 the dandies of the Regency get attacked. You get very tight clothes, very, very tight collars, and then those old tropes from the 18th century of being rather over-obsessed with continental taste. So here we have a dandy fainting um, at the opera, and the opera, of course, is Italian uh, cultural form, and therefore potentially also suspect as well. Ah, that last air of Signor Non Balinus has thrown him in such raptures we must call the doctor immediately. S Signor Nobles. 
um, in other words, the person who is uh, <laughs> singing on stage, in other words, a castrato. Down to my final two minutes now. Okay, so we get further insinuations insinuations about the court of George IV at Brighton. And as you can see right at the front here, you have a Regency dandy juxtaposed right in front of a woman as if you know he and she are kind of trying on the same clothes and they have the same curvy body. And there's much laughter about dandies being like sort of animals and monkeys foolish and ridiculous. <clears throat> and you may notice in the middle of this one that there's a figure half dressed as a man and half dressed as a woman in the middle of that outfit. Okay, what are you supposed to look like? Well, okay, the dandy's coat of arms compared with the boxer's coat of arms, the true muscular Britain. Focusing on the body rather than focusing on the clothes. Just gonna skip right the way through to a final thing. I have a rather sort of terrific thing there, but I've sort of run out of time. I'll just tell you about it very, very quickly. It was a statue of a, a heroic nude figure. Uh, it's the Achilles statue, it's put up in um, Hyde Park. <clears throat> and there's much laughter about the size of its, um, the fig leaf that would be needed to make it decent. So you can, but basically what, what I'm basically saying there is that people also laughed about muscles as an aspect of dandyism as well. There's a bit of discussion there that I have about uh, Tom and Jerry and life in London, which is all about how to go and party um, in the period immediately kind of after, kind of after the Regency, <coughs> which is ded dedicated to, um, then to George the Sixth, George the Fourth. But the message that you got actually about the dandies from the Regency onward into the Victorian period was that they weren't actually figures of containment and polite decency, but actually figures of dangerous success. And this is actually part of the stereotype and even part of the reality of what George the Fourth was actually like, as in Jill Gilray's for luxury. My last two slides. The book itself looks at bobs, macaronis, dandies, and it looks at its aesthetes in the late 19th century and then their aesthetes in the early 20th century as well. I want to compare things. How a dandy might wish to be seen and how a dandy was seen. This is Harper Pennington's uh, portrait of Wilde, age 27 in 1884. This is the pared down minimalist dandy look pioneered from the man of sensibility, the man of feeling of the 1780s onwards. Plain, elegant, very carefully dressed, someone who does dress themselves very carefully, but definitely not over the top. And here's the satire. One of these two, they're both cartoons by Max Beerbohm. One of them is supposed to be George the Fourth, and the other one is supposed to be Oscar Wilde. I just, I think it's rather interesting that they're basically kind of the same person, which is my final point, which is the th one of the things about dandyism is it's strange kind of repetition. Because when we see a dandy today, we're not just seeing the dandy, we're also seeing a kind of dandy tradition a cultural tradition which in some ways is conformist and in some ways is actually deeply subversive and hugely interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for having to zoom in terms of speed a little bit and I'm now going to shop, stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dominic, for giving us that uh, uh, wonderful insight into the, the culture of the 18th and 19th centuries and uh, such a visual feast as well in those wonderful uh, illustrations. Um, I'm going to now look and see what we have in the Q&A. Um, one, um, um, attendee says, what a fascinating dissection of the Venn diagram of gender politics we have here. 
of fashion and nationality. It feels very much of the moment. I'm thinking of the new exhibition at the V&A, Fashioning Masculinities. Do you think there is an increasing interest in examining these intersections in current cultural discourse? Mm. Um, well, of course, you know, all, all, all academics are delighted if people are suddenly notice what they're doing and thinking, oh, yes, 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 it's important. Um, well, yes, yes, I do, actually. Um, and, and obviously, you know, I, I too am a creature of my time. So there is perhaps some reason why I'm actually interested in some of these things as well. Um, and I think, I think one of the things that, that's, that's pushing this forward at the moment is uh, people questioning traditional gender binaries. So interest in um, the status of uh, trans people, for example, and people, uh, a lot of other people are kind of thinking, well, actually, are we, are we at a stage where we're, we're actually radically rethinking some of these expectations? And in relation to fashion, again, high fashion, but maybe also street fashion, uh, there's increasing exploration of uh, clothing, which is not clearly uh, male, female. Although I would actually point out, and I pointed this out to a class uh, recently, that um, if you look back a few generations, and you'd actually pointed out that in my classroom, as far as I knew from the register, there were half people who identified as male and half people identified as female, and everyone seemed to be wearing jeans. I, I think people would have been rather taken aback in previous centuries about the thought that you know women would just wear trousers. Hmm? So actually, um, we 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 we've made a lot of a kind of uh, progress in relation to rethinking some of these traditional roles, um, but actually. Uh, we're at a stage where I think people are thinking about what are the next steps in relation to this. So a couple of next steps are one, body transformations, the degree to which it becomes easier to rethink yourself and recreate yourself as male or female. Um, and then another thing which is really interesting, of course, is, is virtual, the virtual world, where people in the virtual world are assuming um, all sorts of avatars, which have, may, may not have gender at all or may not be the gender that they actually initially identify with. So we're, it is um, a brave new world. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Chris Fletcher who wants to know, it's a very interesting question, are today's dandies different in France and Britain? <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, right. So I mean, one question of course is the identity question, which is, um, who identifies as a dandy? I um, some people do. I mean, you know, there are some people, there was someone called Sebastian Horsley, um, who was a, a sort of a socialite and a party figure in London, who self-consciously presented himself as a dandy. And his signature thing was wearing a bright scarlet suit and scarlet top hat, for example. Now, but I suppose one thing that's that's kind of underlying that question about Britain and France is also that um, there is a tradition, there was a tradition certainly in the 19th century of taking dandies seriously as um, reading dandyism as an aesthetic and political stance. So that I think there is an element of, of, um, of behavior in France, should we say, that would be more attuned to the kind of practice that I'm doing at the moment, which is saying that dandyism is about far more than just clothes. And I think that probably is the difference. Whereas here, there is still quite an intense um, tendency to assume that dandyism is a one issue pose, if you see what I mean. It may be very interesting, but it's limited. So that may be a distinction between the two countries. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, we don't have another um, in the Q&A so far, but I just wondered, uh, I was mm. fascinated myself by this association you made between gender and colour and the shift to a different and darker palette. Could you expand a little more on that? Because that, that seemed to be quite a fascinating uh, association. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes, that's right. So 
Um, there are two things. One of them, one of them is the distinction between colourful and colourless, if you see what I mean. Then the the other one is also the question of what colours. So that um, it, it's very it was very clear from the late twentieth century that uh, a lot of people thought in terms of um, blue for a boy and pink for a girl, for example. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and some people would say, oh, well, there's something intrinsically pink about little girls because you know they can all sort of emotional and small. And I mean, quite apart from the fact that that only works for white little girls, right? <laughs> Doesn't work racially speaking for other people. Um, and then, so, but on the other hand, it's rather blue, it's rather peculiar. I, mean, it's, I would be a little bit worrying if a little boy was kind of bluish in colour. It would be not very healthy. So these are artificial things, right? So there are there are reasons why particular colours get certain um, associations. So um, there are, for example, um, there's a book that was written. Well, there's a number of books. There are quite a lot of histories of colours: the colour blue, the colour black, or this kind of thing. Um, and one of the one of the arguments that has been made about dark colours and sombre colours is that they have long been associated in Europe with um, sobriety and authority, ideological authority, particularly the ideological authority of the church. And that at the Reformation, in some parts of Europe, um, some of the more, how can I put this, Protestant end of things, started dressing in the dark colors previously used by priests and monks. So we're talking about you know, some of the Dutch, for example, some of the Swiss. And some of this happens in Britain as well with Puritans. So there's a kind of association with um, taking yourself seriously as a religious authority, even if you're not a clergyman, right? In certain forms of Protestantism that establishes potentially colourful dress as being a bit frivolous and potentially a bit kind of immoral. Now, of course, what that means in Britain is that, as, as you know, Britain, it sort of seesaws backwards and forwards between more or less Protestant, <laughs> sometimes slightly Catholic, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and you get different sort of sartorial uh, re reactions to all of that as well. So the, the rise of the sort of the sober dress gets associated um, in Britain, it's maybe other distinction with France as well, it gets association, associated in Britain with Protestant sobriety as well, which is not something I, I really talked about, but it also fits into the picture that I talked about earlier on, you know, of a stereotype of colourful Catholic uh, layman and sober Protestant ones as well. So there are lots of different aspects to this issue of the eschewing of, uh, of colour, but that's certainly another, another one of them. And the, the, the bit that I was emphasising was that the more that bright colours were associated with women, the more dark colours could be used to uh, emphasise and underwrite your masculinity. So those two things actually work together. Okay, thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, we have a question from your publisher, actually, uh, oh, Samuel. Yes, that's, uh, he's very interested uh, in the talk. And uh, mm -hmm. do we know if the prevailing view in society about dandies was as pejorative as the satire suggests? Ah, yeah. or were they perhaps regarded with greater tolerance, if not acceptance? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, my, my line on this one it is, you know, just going back to Wilde's point about the only thing about, you know, being talked about is not being talked about. Um, is that actually the, the, the satire and the parody, I mean, there's a whole range of it, isn't there? I mean, it, it ranges from um, satire, which is essentially supportive and, and amused. You know, the dad's army kind of stuff you know you actually love these characters right um you don't hate them you don't i mean they're slightly ridiculous but actually you're really on their side the other extreme is i suppose you know the kind of caricature 
that was launched by Nazi propagandists in relation to the image of Jews, which is utterly horrific distaste for all this kind of stuff. So that the whole realm of kind of parody and satire has quite a wide range of registers. And I think that the, 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 the British register is actually has some very, very strong elements of affection and interest mixed up with anxiety. So that last thing where I showed you, you know, the Max Beerbohm, for example, um, that uh, Max Beerbohm, who was one of the, you know, younger friends of, uh, of Oscar Wilde, but someone who was, uh, well, you know, of unclear sexuality, but he didn't sort of know what was actually going on in that circle. Um, and he drew Oscar Wilde as a figure of excess, but wrote after the trials of 1895 that he had no idea that people would actually look at these things and recoil with horror. And in fact, the police inspector, one of the prosecuting police inspectors, pinned one of his cartoons up uh, on a board of evidence, of incriminating evidence. But that wasn't what Beardburn intended at all. He actually was intending to say, gosh, this guy is, um, well, he's a bit much, but he's just a sort of, but there's almost sort of celebrating the excess of the extraordinary nature of this, this sort of entity in front of him. He didn't really think of it as a monster, but which brings us to the other point about the parody and so forth is that there's one thing, which is what the creators actually thought of it. And then there's what the general public actually thought as well. One, thing, one final thing I would just say is that the macaroni craze, the macaroni craze in the print shops. So there was a passion for buying drawings of macaronis, all sorts of macaronis, um, uh, macaroni bricklayers, macaroni farmers, even an Oxford macaroni, right? So it's hard to imagine that there could be such a thing, but yeah, indeed. Um, anyway, and so it was, I mean, I think so people actually rather loved all of this. They thought it was rather terrific, all these kind of eccentric types kind of going around. Now, when it starts to get associated with um, public scandals, um, sodomy trials, people fleeing the country, then the mood changes quite rapidly. Um, the joke goes out of it. But I think what's really telling is that actually when that happens, they stop drawing the cartoons. So actually, when it starts to get really nasty, people step away from the visual parody. So yeah, I think all of these things work in together. Okay. We have just one more question. It has to be rather cool. fast. Um, the Robert Wilson says that I have in front of me a print made and published by Matthew Darby in the late 18th century. It is entitled The Fluttering Macaroni. Oh, and yeah. it depicts a large, well-dressed young lady toying with a diminutive man who appears to be standing on her hands. Is yeah. this a common on a type of relationship? Yes, absolutely. So, yes. So one of the um, one of the implications right, of this is um, that if the man has become more like um, a woman, that the woman might start to become more like a man. Uh, and in the 18th century, what happens is that um, there are concerns that, uh, that the men will become basically the, the toys of the women, actually, right? In the late 19th century, it's a different concern. Uh, and it ties into the arrival of a new figure, a figure called the new woman. Uh, and this is associated with the suffrage movement and all this kind of stuff. And they start to they start to have rather strange sort of um, eugenic fears for the future of the race, androgynous future of the race, and all sorts of other weird kind of things. But the earlier stuff, it's more to do with the notion of, hmm, okay, you're going to get a young lady of strong of strong character who's basically going to end up toying and and. and running the household and all sorts of other shocking things like that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. I think that is absolutely fascinating talk, which I think we've all enjoyed immensely. And I think what we all need to do now 
if we haven't done it already, is go out and buy British dandies. I know that Samuel wants us to, to do that and to look at all those uh, fantastic illustrations. So on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you so much for giving us this wonderful talk this evening. Okay. Thank, and thank you so much for, for hosting and it's been a pleasure to be here as well. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye to everyone. Yes. <laughs>